Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to Lumina College and welcome to this very first session of our faculty development workshop series. Uh, the title, as you can see, is Future of Business in a Technological Age or in an Age of Technology. Uh, this is the second series, uh, well actually this is the second series of uh, the faculty development jointly organized by um, Lumina College and uh, the University of Hong Kong. Uh, fast score, which is Faith and Science Collaborative Research Forum. Right. The first series was Redeeming Technology. Uh, we had a very good turnout, and if you check out the Fast Score website, all the resources are still up there. I checked yesterday. Right. <laughs> still there. The PowerPoint slides, the discussion questions, the reading lists, and so on and so forth. Right. So this is the second series uh, uh, with a different title because we, apart from pursuing the theme of technology, we would like to uh, explore the uh, evolution or the co-evolution of technology and business together, how they shape each other, how they shape the world, how they shape behavior, and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, if you have had the time to check the website, uh, we have the materials uploaded on the FASTCORE uh, website too, right? I checked yesterday. <laughs> okay. Have you had the chance to look at the materials on the uh, website? If no, it's okay. Right. And out there, as you can see, Mike has very thoughtfully put all the references, the books, out there. So during the break, you can check them out. Um, now, who better to give you a uh, introduction and also an official welcome than the founding president of Lumina College, uh, Dr. Wing Tai Lung himself. So without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Lung. A round of applause for <laughs> Dr. Lung. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Each one of you worth a thousand people because you are change agents. Lumina has many courses, diploma, masters, and seminars. But this is faculty development series. This is the leaders of the leaders. So hopefully through our brainstorming, then we will be uh, learning from each other and learning from God to face the contemporary world, and you are the change agent. So we think this is the most important sessions among all Lumina, maybe Hong Kong U endeavors. Right, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> Now, there are three words that we have to focus on this second series. Future, business, and technology. Future scenarios, futuristics. Sometimes we create a future, sometimes the future comes before we are ready. And business, everyone is in some kind of business, right? Otherwise, you won't be here. And then technology, the way machine that we use is shaping our society and eventually may be shaping us, but it's not deterministic. It's an interactive engagement. So I try to highlight this series and then they'll give you some idea how we're going to go about it. Now, there are many areas of technology that's really flying with FinTech, uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and uh, big data, analytics, surveillance, biotech, huh? gene editing, cloning, AI, robotics, cyborg, all those things. First of all, is technology neutral? Is it neutral? Just a tool for you to solve problems. Or it has certain values, the way it was shaped. And then when we use it constantly, it will be a trade-off that we gain something and we may lose something. Huh? The first series that we have was uh, redeeming technology. So we talk a little bit about that. Values in design. And then the logic of rationality. Jack Alou mentioned that technology tends to drive for rational solutions to things. Machine culture. Uh, when you type the word farm factory in the YouTube, all the animals, all the things that we eat are brutally brought into an assembly line, killed, uh, slaughtered, and then if you are not, you know, weighty enough, then you will be executed. Uh, same for examination, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, is technological solution a solution or threat to global problems? Uh, 
And then we have people like Neil Postman talk about technocracy, the rule of technology, and even technopoly, uh, technopoly, uh, the dictatorship of technology, and then business beyond utilitarianism. You know, we tend to use it instrumental. Technology is neutral that you use it, not exactly, uh, not exactly. And uh, now we have disruptive technologies, the steam. The steam, uh, what do you call it? The steam boat, uh, the steam boat. Invention of the steam boat, uh, the steam machine, uh, the steam motor, and then we have the invention of telegraph. Then we have elections and time-space change. Uh, invention of the car, uh, which replaces uh, the, the horse carriage, and then we have the internet. Uh, many of those are disruptive technologies. There's a book called Future. The history of the futures, in other words, the emerging technology. How would it affect us today? There are history for us, but for the people at that time, it was the futures. So today, we are trying to ponder on the future. So where is human dignity and God's sovereignty among all this? That's the key question that we are trying to ask. What is human dignity and God's sovereignty when you have business of disruptive technologies? And then we we have five sessions. The first one is consumerism and growth. Huh? Consumerism is it for granted? We have the work called exponential through technology. We have expen exponential and also of a different kind of growth. Uh, suddenly, human up to this point, we have the ability to tap all the resources of Mother Earth in our generation. We can scrap it all and use it for our generation. <laughs> that is scary. <laughs> what happened to the future generation? Okay, disruptive technology is applying to business and education beyond zero sum emission. Huh? When we mess up the home, and the mother came, and then we are like children, or we won't mess up anymore. Is zero sum, zero emission good enough? Or we have to put the house back into order? <laughs> Okay, technology and the global order of business. How would technology help to shape the global order of business? And commodifying the world. We can modify education. We can modify culture. We can modify network. We can modify the family. Can modify people. And then at the end of the day, we can modify ourselves. Everyone has a price tag, right? Huh? Huh? Like the book of Judges, chapter 17. The young man has a price tag. That you want to be uh, the uh, high priest, the priest of one family or one nation or one ethnic tribe. You know, we have a price tag, commodification. All right? And then we have uh, a very good uh, a bunch of scholars and practitioners and uh, business people in the area of uh, development, uh, in the area, area of retail, in the area of uh, jewelry, area of. Uh, Information technology, and then the environment, and the uh, world order leadership, and so on. So we will have a very good five sessions together. Now there are two books that are required reading that you have to buy, either Kindle. Uh, first of all, we have <coughs> the first book, The Future of Business. How do you say, Rohit Tawa? <laughs> huh? The future of business. Critical insights into a rapidly changing world from 60 future thinkers. Now, what is this book? This book is, is mapping the future for us. The future of technology, the future of business, future of social landscape, future of humanity, future of society, future of environment, the future of the way we do things, the, the way we live. It's always the future. And the conclusion is, how can you harness the future and become a leader? In other words, you have to fit in and lead it, right? Very positive, very positive, right? And then we have the second book, which tend to caution us. Uh, John Dyer, From the Garden to the City. In the Garden of Eden to the City of Jerusalem. Uh, how Christian look at technology, redeeming and corrupted, the redeeming and corrupting power of technology is redemptive and corruptive at the same time, uh, aren't we all? And he talks about uh, all the Bible, 
uh, implications and incidents of technology, and also people like Chuck Lee, Lewis Mumford, you know, Neil Postman, and all these thinkers of technology. And then how would it apply today? So we have a good combination. One is highly futuristic and positive, and one is more structural thinking and Christian underlying philosophy. So we hope that you will uh, read those books. And uh, for this session, you're supposed to have read chapter, uh, one of the chapters of this one, uh, page 29 to 49. Actually, in my Kindle, the pages number are different. <laughs> it depends on the size of the phones. <laughs> and then supposed to have read uh, chapter 4 to 6 of this one. Now, it has created a tri- what we call tetrad. Tetrad. What is tetrad? Tetrad is four points of technology reflection. First of all, reflection. Second is uh, rebellion. Third is redeeming. And fourth is restoration. It creates a certain model for you to look at technology. So go in and read, right? And uh, I think that's all. So hopefully, uh, we'll have a good time. And, uh, and thank you for all the uh, speakers and participants. I think this is a very important series for us to ponder. Shall we have a word of prayer before we go? Our Father, we thank you for giving us time. And Hong Kong is situated at the very uh, forefront of technology. And we have China, you know, we have uh, one country, two system, blossoming of all this incubation of technology. We have the West and the East meeting here. We pray that Lumina and Hong Kong U will be a good platform of stewardship. Let us brainstorm and share from your word and also to see the world from the lens of faith. In the name of Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Learn, for the very succinct introduction. As you know, the topic today is consumerism and growth. And let me give you a very brief introduction on our speaker today, Dr. Winnie Fong. Dr. Winnie Fong is currently Associate Professor at Lumina College. She uh, previously was uh, Associate Professor at Wheaton College, where she also received her theological training. She got an MA in Biblical Studies there, but she herself is a mathematician and economist. She's got a PhD from Harvard University. Her research interests are development, economics, health economics, and poverty allevi alleviation. Right. So uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Winnie Fong to speak to us today. So uh, please, Dr. Winnie Fong, a round of applause. Thanks for being here and for um, participating in this workshop series. Um, I'm grateful to be the first speaker. And since this series is about the future of business in the technological age, I'm thinking to use the couple first minutes to really set the stage, um, set up the business landscape that we are going to talk about, and then um, spend some time to talk about the reality and consequences of consumerism and growth and how our Christian faith and Christian worldview can give us a unique lens to talk about these issues. Okay. And we will have some Q&A um, uh, uh, time at the end, but please feel free to like, jump in or ask any questions as we go along. So we live in an era of revolution. Old businesses are being revolutionized and new businesses, new industries, new sectors are being born. And the revolution in the coming 20 years, as Dr. Lang has just mentioned, is going to be automated, going to be highly intelligent and synthesized. Okay. So just to look at some examples uh, of what we call exponential thinking companies today. Okay. So these are the firms that have applied exponential thinking to the design of their businesses in the time to come. And they've seen massive improvements in performance compared to the traditional competitors. So Airbnb, for example, has seen 90 times more listings per employee compared to its traditional competitors. Tesla has 30 times more market capitalization per employee. Google Ventures has 2.5 times more investments in early stage startups. And these exponential performance have also um, translated to huge financial impact. Okay, take Uber, for example. 
So Uber, um, within three years, from 2011 to 2014, had seen a 20 times increase in its valuation. And even for Snapchat, it went from $0 to $10 billion in valuation in three years. So it's, it's in this kind of business landscape that we are reorienting ourselves to think about towards the future. And in this business landscape, um, we do see a number of opposing forces or significant tensions. Uh, Corey will all actually talk about this in detail in one of the readings we've listed. So if you guys are interested, you can um, take a look uh, at um, one of the chapters, early chapters in the book, as Dr. Leung mentioned just now. Okay. But just to give some examples here. Okay. So some of the opposing forces or significant tensions that we'll see would be old money versus new finance. Okay. We'll have digital currencies like Bitcoin becoming more and more popular and widely used. And this could actually create a single global monetary system that could get rid of all currencies and get rid of centralized regulation. Okay. With consolidation uh, versus distribution. Okay. So with consolidation, this means that we are entering a world where winner takes all, or winner takes almost all, in many technology-enabled fields and also um, industries. Like we can think of Amazon, Facebook, Google. So as a result of this kind of consolidation, we should uh, expect unemployment rates to increase and possibly the gap between the rich and the poor to also increase. We have manual versus automated. Okay, we know that AI and robotics is going to drive the replacement of humans by machines. And businesses will soon have to make the philosophical choices between hiring more people for the benefit of society or automating for profit maximization. And we've uh, also talked about those exponential mindset companies earlier on compared to those traditional, more linear thinking uh, companies. But um, even within the business field, we also see uh, examples uh, that, uh, of businesses that use science and technology. So we get more science and technology choices, like um, enhanced versus unenhanced humans, human versus machine intelligence, info versus biotech, and physical versus virtual. Um, when we introduce these science and technology choices into the business uh, arena, uh, we are actually introducing changes to the technological and social ecosystem. Okay. Neil Postman once said, technology is ecological, not additive. So when we add these choices in, this is like putting a shark into a fish tank. We're not just adding a fish, we are adding a shark. And by definition, the shark is going to change the ecosystem uh, of what's in there. Okay. So for instance, when we talk about um, technology that has to do with enhanced versus unenhanced humans, human versus machine intelligence, we are basically starting to blur the boundaries between human and machines. And this kind of boundary blurring will increase more and more as we go along. So it is against um, such a business landscape that we'll think about consumerism and growth today. Um, I do want to highlight some common parameters, uh, some assumptions that underline uh, our discussion today and that would help form the bedrock on which some further discussions may be based on. Okay. So as um, Dr. Lam have also mentioned just now, first, we assume neither technology nor markets are neutral. Uh, well, take, for example, digital music downloads iTunes are not neutral. If people uh, say that uh, digital music downloads are neutral, basically they are meaning, they're saying only the content of the music matters. Like whether it's Christian pop or like rock music, only the content matters, but not the mode of delivery. Okay? But we believe that when we say technology and markets are not neutral, we believe that the mode of delivery actually matters. Okay? When I can actually download iTunes, um, the way I decide what soundtracks to buy, the way I construct my playlist actually changes. It changes my behavior. This is what we mean by not neutral. Okay. So technology and markets do play a role in influencing the decisions that people make, even though, of course, people themselves are also responsible for those decisions. And we believe there is a value, indeed, and an, an urgency to examine the deep underlying assumptions, beliefs, and culture, rather than just the service method or um, practice of doing business. Okay. And by um, talking about assumptions, beliefs, and culture, we are basically talking about the worldview. What is the underlying worldview? What is the meta-narrative that we have and that we use to make sense of the world around us? Um, we do believe there's a lot of goodness um, in the secular world thinking uh, and response in the business world. Okay. So we don't want to um, fall into the tendency of black-white thinking. Business is good, business is bad, technology is good, technology is bad. Okay. We want to um, both recognize the goodness and the limitations. 
And when we think about the call to the church um, or call to Christians, we really need to go beyond personal ethics, business ethics, corporate social responsibility, or even business as mission BAM models. Um, those are really important, and we have to talk about them. But we also need to go one step further, one step deeper. We need to address the underlying worldview um, that actually exists in the dominant culture and talk about what um, God's call should be um, from a Christian perspective. And we do believe that um, we need to respond to God's call to create culture. Um, and we'll talk more about uh, what that means as we uh, go along. So these are some of the common parameters. Um, and now we can go on to talk about uh, consumerism and growth. So does everyone recognize the picture on the right? Um, okay, so this is taken uh, in 2016. Do people know what this festival is? Okay, so, so, yeah, yes, 11, 11, so, so, yeah, um, uh, November 11, Singles Day. So Singles Day now has become the biggest e-commerce day ever in history. Um, just this year, Alibaba sold more than $30 billion worth of products in one day. Okay, they sold more than $7 billion worth in the first 20 minutes. So that's the amount of goods sold in the U.S. in the Thanksgiving weekend, okay, on Cyber Monday and um, Black Friday. So it's, it's, it's amazing. Okay. So $30 billion is like 10% of the entire Hong Kong economy. Okay. So Hong Kong's entire economy right now is just about $341 billion. So you can see we are living in this kind of world, like, um, like massive consumption. Okay, actually, next week, next Wednesday, it's like Serang Sao Yi, like December 12th. So it's going to be the second biggest like, e-commerce festival. Okay. Now, the um, second world does recognize that we live in an era of consumerism. Okay. The Daily Mail reported a new study that shows that um, the percentage of British women who are addicted to shopping is about 25%, one in four. So we, we, we know that when people like to shop, we shop to feel happy, to satisfy some inner yearning. Okay. And research even shows that we should spend money on experiences, not things, if we want to get the biggest bang for the buck. Okay. But the world also recognizes that, well, consumption or unending consumption is not sustainable. Consumerism is eating our future. So the uh, rhetoric that we often hear is, well, how do we deal with this? The resulting solution, one of them that people often talk about is, well, we need to come up with new energy sources, um, new technology, so that we can stop depleting all natural resources in the world. Okay. Another solution is to advocate for minimalism. Okay. Minimalist living, green living, slow lifestyles, slow fashion. Okay. There's also a new term called enoughism that came out very uh, recently. So enoughism says that there is actually a satiation point. Okay? So there's a point where consumers buy everything that they need and they don't need anything more. They are fully satisfied. And if they buy more, it actually makes them worse off. Okay? So I don't know whether you guys buy into this e enoughism-like theory. Okay? So I don't as an economist. Okay? Economists believe that people have unlimited wants. Okay? There's no satiation point. Okay? But um, uh, the point is, okay, talking about waste, about greed, about unsustainability uh, is important, but they still don't get at the heart of why consumerism can be so dangerous. Consumerism can be very dangerous because it actually speaks to our souls as to who we are, okay, our innermost identity. Okay. Who am I? I'm one who consumes. My self-identity is tied up with what I choose to consume. So the world that I'm in tells me, okay, I choose to wear these clothes today, the world I'm in or the culture that I'm in tells me that the clothes that I choose reveal who I am. Okay, it reveals my taste, it represents my inner psyche, my personality, or even my status. Okay. So um, somehow my self-worth gets tied up with what I can and cannot consume. Drew Austin uh, has a very nice article uh, in the Real Life magazine um, that talks about the constant consumer. So he uses Amazon as a case study. He talks about how Amazon's mission is to make customer identity the most primary identity um, of people, okay? even more primary than the identity of citizenship. So Amazon wants you to think, I am a customer or I am a consumer. First, people thinking I'm a Hong Konger. So looking back, um, at history, we see that the customer role used to be temporary and specific. You are a customer only when you physically walk into a store, only when you actually order something from a company. Okay. 
But nowadays, um, we inhabit a different kind of world, okay? a hybrid of the digital and the physical. And in this world, we can think of it as an everything store. Okay? So everything is up for grabs, everything is up for purchase and consumption. Basically, our role of a consumer is no longer temporary. We permanently inhabit the role of a uh, consumer. Also, recent technologies have enabled the role of customer to be fused with the role of user. Okay? And as a user, we inhabit an entire ecosystem instead of just a particular transaction. Okay? So take uh, app-based food delivery, for example. Okay? I just moved back to, to Hong Kong from the States this summer, and I was shocked at how food-obsessed Hong Kong people are. But this is good. Like, there are a lot of good choices. Um, but there are a couple of uh, app-based food delivery in Hong Kong, like Deliveroo, Uber Eats, um, what else, Food Panda. I okay, don't know what, whether you guys have tried that before. Okay, Food Panda. Okay. So these apps is, has a very minimal interface. You simply order your food with a push of a button. Okay. So what this tells you is that, well, I don't need to think about the messy complexities. I don't need to think about the labor and logistical complications outside which um, guarantee food delivery. As a user, okay, I'm at the center, and anything outside of the center doesn't matter to me. Okay. So, so what this means is that um, for these apps, they don't even need to let you know what's going on. Okay. Uh, as the user, I just, I just need my food delivered to me. I don't care what happens outside. Okay. So all these things, I don't care what's happening outside, all these outside messy complexities are excluded from the user experience. And um, there's also this uh, slogan, I think all of us are very familiar with, the customer is always right. Okay, so this quote as actually has been attributed to a department store tycoon in 1909. Okay, so back in those days, we already talked about these things. Okay. So customer satisfaction is a very attractive concept. It's very nice for a company to say, we prefer customer satisfaction, or we highly prioritize customer satisfaction. That's a much better narrative than saying, we highly prioritize profit maximization, or we highly prioritize like, market capitalization. Okay. So it's, it's actually good for um, companies to say that, like, we really uh, value customer satisfaction. Um, and as an example for Amazon and the CEO Jeff Bezos, this year in a letter to his shareholders uh, in April, Jeff Bezos actually praised Amazon's customers for being defining discontent. Okay, that's his word, defining discontent. Okay. So basically saying, well, customers are always discontent. They always want more stuff, cheaper, quicker, faster. And he said that it is this discontentment of customers that actually propel Amazon to grow, it propel Amazon to innovate so that it keeps on producing faster, cheaper. Um, and uh, Oh, I must admit I use Amazon all the time, okay, since I, I live in the States. Um, uh, so I was already um, really enjoying the next day delivery service, but then afterwards they start having one day delivery, and now um, they have one hour delivery, which I think is pretty crazy. So this is why they, they are talking about uh, drones, like if they are able to like, get a lot of drones, then they could definitely do a lot of like, one hour delivery or even half hour delivery, especially in po um, densely populated cities. Okay. But the idea is that um, when, when customers are taught to think that way, it means that, well, I can basically sit in front of a computer, okay, look at the picture of a product, and simply press a button saying, I want that, and I want that now. Okay. And very soon, our wants will morph into a need. Okay. I'll sit then from out of my computer and say, I need that, and I need that now. Okay. So this is the danger. Okay. As uh, Drew Austin said, this is the fundamental problem. Amazon's constant praise of the customer for being defining discontent um, implies we are all already customers and nothing more. Okay. That we should understand consumer as our core identity. Now, what are the consequences of understanding consumer as our core identity? First, it makes us internalize the desires and values that these businesses promise us. Okay. Comfort, convenience, choice, frictionless consumption. Ideally, we should be consuming out of our own convictions and values, but now consumption is dictating to us what our values and desires should be. Okay, it is changing our worldview. It also forecloses other identities we might imagine for ourselves, like community participation, resource stewardship, uh, social activism. At a structural level, it moves us towards a market-based populist culture, okay, where individual libertarianism is highly valued. Okay. 
And in our culture nowadays, um, most people do not value or even have no idea what common good is. It destroys a sense of community because we no longer see ourselves as active participants um, who are responsible for the welfare of others. And we introduce this kind of customer service logic to our traditional cultural spaces and to our communities, okay, even like going to church. Okay, we know that people shop around churches, trying to find a church with a worship style that they might like. And some churches actually do respond to these kind of consumer demands. Okay. On an interpersonal level, it dehumanizes and commodifies others. Okay. So um, Neil Postman has also talked about how technology or actually Jackaloo, has also talked about how technology has a dehumanizing tendency. Okay? Um, as we use to know more technology, we're, we're more likely to treat ourselves and to treat other people like machines. Okay? So nowadays when people talk about AI, um, they are worried that machines become more and more intelligent and they will become like us. Um, but the problem is not that machines will become more like us, it's we become more like machines. Okay? Actually in Hong Kong nowadays, I think a lot of people work like machines. Okay. At work, our salary and our worth uh, is determined by, in a very mechanical way, okay, by, by how much we produce. And even at school, kids work like machines. They produce grades like machines. And ultimately, it really speaks uh, to um, our inner sinful nature. Our, our sinful nature of wanting to be independent of God, wanting to be in control. Okay? We want to be in control of our world, of our environment, of our own selves. Okay? And as we seek to control and manipulate the world and nature, this often leads to the depletion of resources. Okay? So what consumerism does is it simply breeds a distortion of our self-image, and it breeds a distortion of the image of others and of the world. And this leads us ultimately to two questions. Okay. Who am I? Okay. I'm one who consumes. Who's in control? I'm the one in control. Okay. Uh, I, I call this the master of the universe narrative. Okay. So this reveals how old I am, I guess. So this is in the like, 80s, like really hit, like He-Man and Sheila series. I don't know whether people have seen that before. Okay. So in this master of the universe narrative, we take on the identity and role of the master, the owner, instead of the steward and the servant. St. Augustine has a very um, nice way of putting it. He calls this um, really the base of all sin, this incurvature of the soul. It's this inward turning of the soul towards ourselves so that we become self-centered instead of turning outward toward God and toward others. Um, as the master of the universe, we simply do not acknowledge or accept the limitations God has given us. Okay. This is like Adam and Eve. We want to be like God. We don't accept the limits that God placed on us. Okay. And we want to construct a world that allows us to exist apart from him. Okay. Um, and as Adam and Eve use, um, they make their new clothes. So actually making clothes is a new kind of technology as well. They are trying to transform the environment so that they could live independently of God. And, and today we do that as well. Okay? And as we think about how to transform our environment to live independently of God, we think about how technology, how businesses can help, help us actually achieve growth. Okay? We diligently pursue growth because it helps us with our consumption habits. It helps us with our living standards. Okay? And, and the, the, the key term nowadays is like sustainable growth. Okay? So like almost every government wants to say like we want to like aim for sustainable growth. Uh, so I'm an economist, so the next couple of graphs will reveal my economist side. Okay. Um, so this is um, a graph showing uh, growth GDP. Okay. There are different definitions of growth and different metrics for growth, but the most common one used in the world today is GDP, gross domestic product. Uh, this is basically the total market value of goods and services that a country produces or an economy produces per year. And this graph actually shows human history. Okay, so this goes from 1 AD all the way to 2015. Okay. And you can see in almost the entirety of human history, there's no growth, right? The line is flat. So growth is actually an extremely recent phenomenon in human history. Okay. We only see growth like starting there. Okay. 
Um, and once growth started, okay, that's where like technology starts coming into play, we see that it takes on this exponential pattern. Okay? And with this kind of exponential growth, we also see an exponential increase in living standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So most historians think that it started around the early 19th century. Um, so um, 1900s would probably be in the, it, it's already started, actually, this kind of growth. Yep. So think of it as kind of like the, the 19th century, okay, that we see exponential growth starting. Uh, we see the same pattern for population growth. Okay? So for this graph, we actually go back even further. Okay? You can see 180 there, and we go back 10,000 years to 10,000 BC. Okay? So this is human history in the past 12,000 years. And you see, again, in almost the entirety of human history, there's little population growth. Okay? People were born, people died, and that's it. Okay? You kind of balanced out. Okay? Um, but uh, as we have advancement in technology, People um, live a longer life, fewer people die of infectious diseases, fewer mothers and babies die in childbirth, and we see this exponential population growth. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the kink, you mean? Yeah, the kink is usually what people um, start talking about public health and sanitation, when people start understanding how water works, how sanitation system works, and they start reducing child infant mortality rate. They start having uh, fewer infectious diseases deaths. That would be around like 16th, 17th century. So um, this might help with uh, Mike's problem. So uh, we, we, we zoom in a little bit, right? Like this is from 1820s to 2016. And the earlier two graphs is for the entire world. But if we look at particular countries, we see the same pattern. Okay? So from the early 19th century up to 21st century, all countries around the world see the same increasing pattern of growth. Okay? Uh, this is GDP per capita, gross domestic product per capita. You can think of this as income per person. Okay, so how much income each person earns per year in each country. Okay. So you can see the first uh, top two lines are US and UK. Okay. It's not um, surprising. Like they are rich countries. And then the um, yellow line in the middle is Hong Kong. Okay, Hong Kong started off to be quite poor in 1820, and then it increases sharply. Now we are at the same living standard and same income level as US and UK. Same with Singapore. Okay. And then you have the red line being China and the blue line being India. So even though China and India right now are about halfway um, compared to the other uh, countries, you can see there's a very steep slope. Okay? So this is what we call rapid catch-up growth. Okay? So almost all countries nowadays have these kind of rapid catch-up growth pattern. Now, where does this growth come from? Okay, uh, the answer is not surprising. We have increasing income because we are becoming more and more productive. So this graph um, actually shows the labor productivity or output per hour worked. Okay, you can imagine, like, in the past, if we are using typewriters, we can only type, like, one book chapter every three days. And now with computers, we can type one book chapter maybe, like, within three hours. Okay, so this is what we mean by productivity output per hour. Okay, so you can see U.S., U.K., Singapore, Hong Kong um, all have this increasing line. Right? Or people are simply becoming more and more productive. And people are becoming more productive because basically of technology. Now, not just human beings, but animals become more productive too. Okay, so if you plot the same graph just now for pigs, for hens, for cows, they actually have the same exact pattern. Okay. So this is another way to see it. Um, in 1961, this is the cattle meat yield. So how many kilograms of meat can one cow produce? Okay. So in 1961, the light green means that a cow can produce 60 kilograms of meat. So this is a less productive cow. Um, by 2014, the darker blue means that a cow can produce 240 kilograms of meat, so a very productive cow. Okay? So we like productivity as a society, basically. We like productivity in ourselves and also in our animals, right? Because we need them to actually sustain our consumption. So this is kind of the, the story that we see. Okay? We continue to consume natural resources, 
so that we can stimulate economic growth, and then with economic growth, we have higher income, and then we can consume more. Okay? So this is um, where energy consumption, again, is like all these graphs have the same kind of shape. Okay? Rapid exponential increase in more and more recent years. In 2014, uh, Bill Gates actually sent out a tweet that shocked the business world. So this is the tweet that B uh, Bill Gates sent out. He said, this is the most staggering statistic like in his tweet. Okay? China used more cement in three years than the US did in the entire 20th century. Okay, so three years compared to 100 years. Okay? Um, but there's no doubt we'll see this kind of statistic again and again and again okay, in the near future. So where does this leave us, right? Um, when talking about consumer strength and growth, it's easy to jump to the surface questions. Okay? How much consumption is too much? Okay? Is it when the con level of consumption cannot be sustained in the long run? Okay? How can we sustain growth and prevent depletion of resources? Do we do it by minimalism? Do we try to reduce consumption, increase production efficiency? Do we try to use alternative energy resources? But these are what we call the how questions. Okay? In our culture today, it's, it's a easy tendency um, to, to, to want to jump and start asking these how questions. Okay? We want to be practical, we want to be applicational. Okay? But before asking these how questions, we need to ask the why questions. Okay? Why do we want unending consumption? Okay, so to make us feel happy, to satisfy some inner yearning, to provide distraction from an otherwise meaningless life? Okay. Why do we want sustainable growth? Like why are we pursuing these kind of business and technologies? Okay. Is it to reduce suffering in the world? To allow us to live a better life? Have a higher living standard? To allow us to live indefinitely? Okay. Um, but just asking these why questions uh, is still not enough. Okay. In order to actually know how to answer these why questions, we need to go one step further. Okay. What are the values being espoused here? What should the values be? Okay. Uh, so today, it's not easy, uh, it's not hard to imagine that the top values being espoused in the world is like productivity, efficiency, functionality. Okay. Actually, Dr. Long has a very nice way to put it, so I'm going to like, copy his. Okay. So he said that human beings used to value truth, goodness, and beauty. But in today's culture, truth is replaced by fact. Goodness is replaced by what works, what's functional. And beauty is replaced by what works well, what's efficient. Okay? So those are the things that we value today. And ultimately, it goes back to the bottom line question. Who am I? Why am I here? Okay. Uh, what does this have to do with my identity? Okay. Is my identity just a consumer? Okay. And what does this have to do with my purpose in life? And the only answer that we could have is to go back to um, what the Bible says, okay? the idea of the Imago Day. So this picture should be very familiar to everyone. It's one of the most, I guess, like replicated religious paintings of all time. Uh, this is a painting by Michelangelo. It's in the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. It's called The Creation of Adam. And you can see in this picture, God's hand is like outstretched, like he's stretching out his right arm. And Adam's left arm is extended, and it's supposed to be in a pose that mirrors God's pose as a reminder of what Genesis 1, 26, 27 says. Okay, man is made in the image and likeness of God. Okay. Um, but a lot of art commentators actually point out that whereas God's posture is convex, explosive, like paternal, Man's posture is actually extremely passive, receptive. Okay? So the man is like, eh, I don't care. I'm like, I have no energy to deal with you. Okay? So, um, so it's interesting for me to hear. Like God like, really wants to reach out to mankind okay? to, to give us this back of life, this river of life. But sometimes man doesn't really know what we are going in for. Okay? We're not actually that eager to reach out. Let us make man in our image. Okay. Genesis 126. So what does Imago Dei mean? Okay, the image of God. Um, using John Dyer's language, uh, this is the language that he used in this book, um, From the Garden to the City. Again, highly recommend this. This is very well written. 
the essence of what it is to be human is to reflect God's image the rest of creation. Okay? Um, we display God's ability to think rationally. Okay? So um, even though some animals also have some form of intelligence, uh, human beings are clearly distinct from the rest of the created order in terms of our rational mind. Okay? We reflect God's relationality. Okay? So the tri-personhood of God. Okay? When God says, let us, we're using a plural language. And this means that human beings are actually made to live in interdependent relationships with God and with each other as well. Um, we are also to have dominion, subdue the earth, and rule over all created things as servant kingship. And finally, we are called to create, to cultivate and keep, to serve and preserve. Um, I find this figure a very good way to put it. Okay? So we often see ourselves as master of the universe on the left. Okay? So we dominate the world. We lord it over all the created order. We rule over everyone else. But this is not, not, not the bi biblical image, right? The biblical image looks more like that on the right. Okay? We are in loving, interdependent relationships with each other and with all of the created order. When God asks us to have dominion and to rule over all created things, God is asking us to be responsible for the flourishing of all the created order. Okay? And what does it mean to co-create? So in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God put the, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Okay. So um, theologians have used this to talk about the creation mandate or the culture mandate. So Genesis 2 begins actually with a barren, lifeless landscape. Okay. No plant of the field had yet sprouted, for there was no man to work the ground. Okay. So there's nothing there. Okay. Actually, the word for ground is a dammer, which is a word play on the word man, like Adam. So the sentence literally reads, there was no Adam for the Adama. But before God put the Adam into the Adama, God first has to produce or plant the Garden of Eden. So God first plants the Garden of Eden and then set Adam down within the garden and give him this simple job, cultivate it and keep it. So in some Bible translation, it used the word cultivate. In some, it uses the word work. Now, it's worth to point out that God has designed the garden in such a way that even before the fall, even before sin has entered the world, the garden is meant to be worked on. So this means that even before the fall, human beings are meant to cultivate and to keep the garden. Okay? So this has nothing to do with the fall. This is even before the fall, God's creation, or God's um, creative mandate. Adam wants to take the natural world and fashion it into something else, something unnatural but still sanctioned by God. Okay. And even though God gives Adam these creative powers, God also put some limits on these powers. Okay. So when you think about the word cultivate, usually it means to rearrange, to create, to shape the garden. Okay. And when we think about the word keep, it typically um, means to guard, to watch over, to maintain some of the original form. Okay. So it seems like what God is asking Adam to do here is to strike a careful balance between the natural and the unnatural. Okay. A balance between the act of cultivating and the act of keeping. And with each creative act, something important happens. Okay. So when Adam chooses, let's say, to use this kind of bridge and put it over here, or to use this kind of plant for this kind of purposes, Adam is making a choice about what matters and how things should be done. And when he modeled this kind of behavior to Eve and to his children and to his children's children, then we are basically forming the basis of what's considered important and meaningful. We are basically forming the um, culture. So, um, to I think a little bit more about the creation mandate and the cultural mandate in Genesis 1 and 2. Okay. Stanley Grimes, uh, he's an American Christian theologian and also an ethicist. Okay. He said that what we create can be broadly divided into four categories. Things, okay, any physical objects, uh, images, objects that are designed to represent something else, like a traffic sign, like a company logo, like our cross that represents our Christian faith, okay, rituals. Um, what we do with these things and images, including like how we brush our teeth, how we set up our coffee and tea. Okay? 
And finally, with language, tools we use um, to share the meaning of these objects, things, and rituals with other people. Okay. So um, Adam's first creative task is actually to use language to name the animals. And as we create and use things, images, rituals, and language with others, we are sharing not only these four items, but we are also sharing what they mean to us. We are sharing meaning. Okay? And this transfer of meaning is culture. In your Brunner, a Swiss theologian said that culture is the materialization of meaning. And Barry Jones said that the sharing of things, like these things, actually mediates three things to us. Identity, meaning, and values. So this means as we are creating things, images, rituals, and language, we're giving them meaning. Okay? And we're communicating these meanings, sharing these meanings with other people. Okay? For example, in this room, uh, as we walk into the room, uh, if we arrange the chairs in this way, okay, in uh, maybe like five rows or four chairs, uh, we would know this is some kind of classroom setting okay, with some kind of authority figure. But if the chairs were arranged in a circle, then we would um, interpret it as a group setting where everything Everyone is equal. Okay. So, so the culture of the room is determined by how we arrange the chairs. Okay. And in our everyday life, we participate in dozens of these little culture-making moments. Okay. And the culture we create communicates identity, meaning, and values to others. Emily Crouch, uh, who is the editor of Christianity Today, has a very nice book called Culture Making. Okay. So from consuming culture to creating culture. Um, he said that culture is what we make of the world, both in creating cultural artifacts as well as in making sense of the world around us. It is not enough to condemn or critique culture. Most of the time, we simply consume culture. So that's where our consumerist nature comes in. Right? We want to consume. We consume culture. But the call to the church is not just to consume culture, not even to condemn or critique culture only. We need to create culture. And any Crouch actually gives uh, some good examples, if you guys are interested. Uh, his book is called Culture Making. He talks about, we need to understand the dynamics of cultural exchange, um, examine the role and efficacy of our various cultural gestures and postures. We need to learn from examples in church history and contemporary society of how culture is made and shaped. And technology gives us tools for cultivating and creating culture. So technology can actually be used to help us fulfill our call to the culture mandate. Okay. Stephen Klein, who's a mechanical engineer, a professor at Stanford, um, he talked about how technology, there could be four layers. Okay. Hardware, manufacturing, methodology, and social usage. Okay. But um, ultimately, okay, no matter what we do, how we do it, culture making is done always in partnership with God's own making and transforming of culture. Okay. It's always God who's taking the initiative. Okay. And we are co-partners, co-creators, co-participants. Okay. So my last slide. Okay. So coming back to the ultimate questions. When talking about consumerism and growth, we are often aware of the surface questions, the how questions. Okay? But we also want to engage the world, engage people around us in the deeper level questions. Who am I? Who is in control? What's the purpose of my life? And as we look towards the future, where we have intelligent machines, enhanced humans, virtual world, digital currencies, we must recognize both the challenges and opportunities and ask ourselves, what aspect of this business or what aspect of this technology do I need to pay attention to? Okay, to discern whether it is steering people away from or drawing people closer towards the grounding identity of Imago Day okay, and the grounding purpose of life of our culture mandate. Okay. So thank you. Okay, so uh, now we are about to start uh, part two of the workshop and before we start, let me give you a very brief introduction of our respondent, Dr. Kelvin Ho. Uh, Dr. Ho has got a PhD in business and management from the University of South Australia. He's currently holding a lectureship with um, Hang Seng University of Hong Kong. Uh, Dr. Ho has many, 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 many years of experience um, in international business. He is the president of Fraser Tech and Fraser Tech Singapore. He is also the chairman of Saints Alp Unions Limited, a Sinjik now. 
I, I have had the luck of listening to uh, the story how uh, Dr. Ho transformed and turned around the business of uh, Saints Elm. <laughs> and I'm not sure whether he has the opportunity to share with you the story, which is an amazing story of God's grace, but um, he has a lot of experience in uh, uh, strategic business uh, transformation and also business startup and retailing and so on. And we are very excited and honored to have him as the respondent today. So uh, let's give it up for uh, Dr. Ho for his response. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh Dr. Mack. Um, uh, one of the very important uh, role, I'm, I'm also the, uh, a teacher, uh, teaching uh, marketing in Hang Seng University of Hong Kong, yeah, a full-time teacher. Um, because I'm a respondent, so I don't want to have my own PowerPoint. Suppose I respond to Winnie's <laughs> presentation, right? Uh, Winnie have done a very Good job, a very great job, I think. Uh, everybody have a very huge macro view. I'll give you uh, the GDP growth from the year one uh, to now. So I think this is amazing. It's amazing. It's uh, open-minded and open-eyed uh, 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 presentation for us. Um, I want to respond to uh, how I respond to this uh, great presentation. Uh, I want to be a practitioner. Uh, practitioner means um, I'm a retailer. I'm running the retail shop, Sinzik uh, Nam, which is a retail train in Hong Kong, uh, America, China, and Philippines. Uh, what I, how I we see the, uh, our customers? Uh, I'm also a, a marketing lecturer, so I will look at it as a from the point of view of consumer behavior, and see from the macro point of view, and see whether this macro point of view can put together become a macro view. See it from another di uh, direction. Okay, is it good? <laughs> okay, okay. Let's try. It. We look at the same problem or a same phenomenon with an other angle, which is a, a micro, micro point of a micro. So if a customer come into our shop, what is their behavior? What we, my, in my observation, they are hunters. They are hunters. Uh, it can explain the consumerism, because it's also a hunterism, I can say. Why? Uh, everybody come to the shop, they have the purpose. They want to hunt the games, right? Hunt something. Which is, the question is, what to hunt, and how much they hunt, and how efficient they hunt. Okay? They hunt for the game, how efficient. What games they want to hunt. Okay? How efficient, how much they want games they want to hunt. So that's come with our technology. Why? Before, long, long time ago, a hunter won a stick, sorry, let's say. How, how can they have it? They need to find somebody, go out to the wild area and find the wild blue and then they hunt and then they cut a piece of sticks, right? And then they can enjoy it. So difficult. By now, we just take our mobile phone. <laughs> the sticks come here, right? So efficient. That's the role of the technology. So efficient. It makes much faster the hunting, faster. Okay? Before, what to hunt? They, by luck, they go out and see. They see a rabbit. They need to hunt a rabbit. They see a blue, wild blue, work together hunting. But they see a lion, they become <laughs> vice versa. <laughs> the lion hunt them, right? So dangerous, right? The choice are limited. By now, you turn on mobile phone, okay. This stick from US, no. I like Japan style, 
right? Right, steak. I don't know. Religious reason, I don't want to steak. I want pork, or chicken, or fish. No matter where, Alaska, fish, good enough, right? So many choices. In my point of view, this is to facilitate the hunting job. It's basically this. It drives the technologies, right? It drives our livings, okay? If we compare, okay, I want to, to show some, uh, okay, you see, all this kind of technology is help us, help our hunting job, right? It help us, right? If, well, before we hunt, we used from here to go there, but now we use Uber, right? You have auto driver. You got, got a lot of things which help us to move from one place to another place. Why we need to move one place from other place? We need to survive sometimes. We need to work. Work for what? Easy hunting. But before the people hunt, they use their weapons. By now, we use currency, right? It's not cash, right? Currency is not cash. I don't know what it's what, right? And if they, and anyhow, it just gives you a number, and that number you can hunt, right? If you don't have this, we'll be a poor guy. So they will go to <laughs> the market state. So this is a problem. So if you look at the uh, GDP, and it's, it's very interesting. Now. So this is a big game, right? So this big game means what? One day, so many hundred hundred state games together become a campaign. All people happy, they are satisfied. To be a hunter, what is a successful hunter? You don't need to think about it. Successful hunter means they can choose the games which is they like to choose, right? And then they can get easily and more effectively, right? This is successful. Successful means also get more. If long, long time ago there's a two hunter in the forest, right, in the wildlife. Okay, a successful hunter will get more games right, than the unsuccessful one. This also defines the success. So this kind of successful definition drive us, drive the market to get more, right? This get more, everybody want to get more, every people, single person want to get more. This is drive of growth. If every single unit get more, that means it is a growth. Is there any limit? This is an interesting question. I want to uh, respond later. So if we look at the, I, I think quite interesting is this uh, graph. I, I want to find this graph, okay. Yes, the GDP. I think that's quite interesting. We see the GDP is from zero to here, right? So zero to here. Um, GDP, uh, we just have discussed before, we may not have that kind of concept, right? So if we redefine, let's say this is a uh, uh, world of many poor people, right? we can say this is uh, richer and richer, richer and richer. But I think this. In some sense, it is quite true. No matter this GDP is meaningful or not, I, I, I think it reflects something. We can imagine, okay, 100 years ago, the richer guy, the most successful hunter, what is the life? The life is very poor in, in the sense of, in the angle of today. They got no education, right? They got no medical benefit, right? So they are so, they, most of the time they were hungry. Not every day can have food to eat, right? Long, long time ago, everybody is like that. Every human being is living in this environment and condition. What we can define from today, from the angle of the eyes of today, they are poor people. They are very poor people in the world. But that time is the richest guy is living like this. 
long, long time ago. All right. That means the system now we developed so many years, a thousand years. The system helped us to overcome the priority problem. Many people overcome it. Of course, somebody is still living in the long, long time ago. They were living in the very basic, basic livings. They also don't have education. They also don't have medical benefits. They also don't have any life security or safety. So I think this is the very bad news if today we're still looking at this problem, right? But any, any, anyhow, we can say this. We can say from because of the economic growth, at least part of the people already solved this problem. But some people, we, we, saw, we say they're unfortunate sometimes. They're still living in the living standard of a few thousand years ago. So this is imbalance uh, development. I, I can see, I want to see this in this angle with micro point of view, right? Because the macro point of view is so, so good, I, I, can, I, I can't find anything <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to perfect it, yeah. So, this also explain why this uh, curve like this, right? Because of the technology, right? In the near view, uh, okay. The, I think of the year of uh, 1900 is, is something uh, our uh, technology grow very fast, right? The technology makes a change, makes everybody can hunt more effective, right? So this is a real changes, right? So. It's some population growth, right? This really makes us very scary, scary, right? The population growth so fast, and how can we sustain and survive? Um, in my co point of view, also, have, if the Earth is just like this size, right? Um, they should have limit. I agree with uh, a, a poor, right? A poor is now just left. Right, I agree. I agree. Yeah, with Peter. Yeah, they should have certain limit, which is S curve. I'm not so sure because, but from the marketing point of view, I more agree with the S curve because marketing, uh, any products have a life cycle. What the life cycle tell us? They are here grow and then will be saturated. <laughs> Maybe end up big through the growth again. They had to say. Yeah, so I will, I will, of course, nobody know what will happen with the exponential growth or whatever, or, uh, or some time which is up to the point like this. Um, but we have um, uh, experience uh, uh, in the uh, developing country and also developed country. Um, our city and the uh, countryside. Uh, which is our observation is in the city, the population growth is mainly the people move from the countryside to the city. But the people living in the city over one generation, the birth rate will go down. So if we along this line, right, we can predict that less and less people living in the countryside because uh, the people want to live together. We have less people to farm. Right? One people can farm a uh, very huge land, right? Because uh, automation, right? Not so many farmers. That means all people will live in the city. If most of people m already migrate to the city, we can expect that the population growth will slow down or decrease. This is, we may, we may expect that. Right, but but by now we're still growing, but just because um, it's still many people not living in the city, right? <laughs> we can expect it. We can expect it if this this trend coming on. Uh, I think the population will uh, a bit decline. Maybe, maybe. Huh? Uh, this this is a good news. I think this is good news for 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 us, right? At least a lot like Paul said, it's have to be war. Right? No, 
not necessarily war because by now you see Hong Kong, every couple, the birth weight is 1.3 around. That means not enough two, right? Two people give 1.3 around this. That means the population is going down. Of course, oh, you see, Hong Kong population is still going up just because the people, this immigration, right? This immigration. They felt immigration. So if more and more people immigrate to the city, we live together, suppose it change. It will change. Yeah. So no, I'm, for, for me, I'm optimistic. Yeah. Not necessary to be war, right? <laughs> to control the population. Maybe human being n know how, how to live and how to learn and how to make well-being. But you would ask uh, the young couple, because from a macro point of view, I always ask, sometimes I ask my student, if you get married, you want to have a baby or not? Some of them, no. <laughs> Why? Yeah, I need to keep them survive. Education, so much pressure. I want to enjoy life. Yeah, so this is, I think, I think it's happened. It's happening. It's happening, especially in the next generation. Yeah, I, I can't see the trend which is growing up. I see it going down. So, is it optimistic or pessimistic? Hard to define, right? <laughs> okay. okay, hard to define. At least, necessary using a war to control the population. I think that's good news, right? It's more civilized, right? So for last ways to, to, to handle this situation. Um, increasing income per person, of course, right? Because every country's developing country, right? So they develop the city. More people and more people live in city. And also the technology. I think this is a, this is a really, really normal, normal situation. Uh, of course, we are productive, right? So we use technology for productivity. And also we have a different kind of variety of food, right? Yeah, because we use technology to give us a variety of food. Yeah. But this variety is what we say is variety with uh, mass production. Very interesting, right? The thing up to our table have variety, right? Because we can choose anywhere from Australian beef or uh, Japan or China or US. We got variety on our table. But from the species point of view, and less and less species, right? <laughs> so this is quite contradictory, quite contradictory. Any, what kind of animal or can put into it? the farming industry, agricultural industry, they can be encouraged. But the encouraged will not be, uh, in, the, in the trend, I don't see this will be a very, only one brief we can choose. No, it's not possible. So the variety will be there. Yeah. On our table, there are variety. So don't worry about it. Huh? But, and also it's productive. Huh? Because the industry depends on the market, depends on all of things. And the market is from the macro point of view, depends on every hunter. Yeah. How? Because hunters seek for variety. Hunters seek for efficient hunting process. So everything has the, the purpose. You may say, okay, just like Paul said, uh, 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 um, uh, some, some uh, by now more product is uh, cosmetics or something like that, right? Which is not really fulfill the functional value. But uh, uh, just uh, Dr. Lung uh, <laughs> uh, discussion is that they still have some purpose. It looks good, right? <laughs> Make us look good. Still have the purpose. So this is, I think I agree, this is still have a purpose. Yeah, there's a purpose. And other purpose is, the basic purpose is, good hunter want more games, more variety. Sometimes they hunt something they don't need. They enjoy the hunting, enjoy the hunting process. Right? This is possible. Yeah. Just like uh, you see many ladies, uh, they go to a shopping mall, while they shop, sometimes they never use it. They just shop it, 
and put right at the home, right? So if, if you look at you. <laughs> so why? Because this this is an enjoyable process, right? This process means I hunt more than you. That's just I'm so successful. So I put it on the Facebook and tell other people I hunt this and that, right? So this is some sort of symbolic function in terms of marketing, which is symbolic. This symbolic means I'm successful. I'm successful hunter. And this is the drive of the micro, micro. In micro profit, this is the drive of the growth of drive of the, all the uh, technology and all the uh, uh, what can see the effect. Yes.